To understand the Clifoth, we must begin with the oldest and now known component of its many fractured parts. This immediately delves us deeply into ancient Hebrew magic lore as the premises for the Goetia, or lesser key of King Solomon, date, at the very least, back to the era of the Essene scribes of Qumran some 2,000 years ago, and, if they are to be believed as authentic and not later antedated, they may indeed trace back to the construction of the first temple under King Solomon, son of King David, around some 3,000 years ago. The Goetia being a list of names, physical descriptions, and sigils for summoning 72 demonic influences may even predate the Exodus some 3,500 years before our modern Aeon. In the ancient reckoning of a year, as being 360 days plus four seasonal holidays and one New Year holiday. The 360 days were divided up into 12 months, three per each of the four seasons. In each of these 12 months of 30 days apiece could be divided up into three weeks each of 10 days apiece. The result is an annual total of 36 weeks. If each week of 10 days is given a day and a night aspect, and thus doubled, then each week of 10 days on the ancient calendar would correspond to one pair of demonic influences from the 72 names given in the Goetia. Since the middle 1500s, at least, grimoires, including material ranging widely from plant medicine and natural philosophy, such as physics, astronomy, and chemistry, to theurgy, demonology, and the study of the dark arts of ritual magic, have been a source of inspiration for aspirants and students of the craft. Studying these copiously, cross-referencing, taking notes, and compiling these notes into one's own grimoires have long been hobbies of ritualists and scholars of magic alike. The so-called Goetia, or Lesser Key of Solomon, was one of the earliest to proliferate during the Renaissance, and it was translated into many different European languages. It was usually paired with the so-called Greater Key of King Solomon, a treatise on magic involving the seven planets and including instructions on how to construct talismans for 36 symbolic seals. Other grimoire systems that flourished at this time were the grimoire of Pope Honorius, the Arbitel and Armadel, the system of Abramelin, and, of course, the theurgic Enochian works of John Dee and Edward Kelly. In the Goetia, uniquely, there are physical descriptions of the entities meant to be conjured. In the planetary magic grimoires, they are simply to be identified as archangels and the demons of Abramelin and angels of Dee and Kelly give little or no physical characteristics for most of the characters they describe. The Goetia provides, thus, not only seals or sigils by which to summon certain intelligences for whatever one's goal, as well as purposes for which to summon each, suggested tasks at which they specialize, etc., but also 72 names with physical descriptions of their characters, so that you may know them when, or if, 
they manifest and appear as conjured. What we can learn about the demonic influences accessible via the Goetia may be best expressed by the 20th century ritual magician Aleister Crowley. From the introduction to the English translation of the Goetia he published, edited by S. L. McGregor Mathers. In this essay, entitled An Initiated Interpretation of Ceremonial Magic, Crowley states in no uncertain terms that the spirits of the Goetia are portions of the human brain and that control over one specific portion of the brain was equivalent to calling up the name of the spirit that represented it. To this end, the grimoire called the Goetia was basically like a telephone book or list of names and how to contact them. Each of the 72 characters came to this end with its own meditative sigil seal. Here, each sigil seal is numbered to correspond to the preceding list of names, and, just so, I have added their corresponding place in the annual round indicating month by astrological zodiac sign and week by A, S, and C, ascendant, succedent, and cadent. The significance of the exactly 72 demonic influences listed in the Goetia Grimoire, as well as that of the 36 seals in the Greater Key of Solomon, stems from the Shimham Farash, the 216 letter long Baal Shem, or Name of God. The Shimham Farash has supposedly been used in Hebrew ritual magic since the era of the Exodus, when, it is said, Moses used it to part the Red Sea. It has long been associated, as such, with the three lines of 72 letters apiece in the Hebrew Torah Book of Exodus describing that event. 3 times 72 equals 216. The exact unscrambling of the single correct Baal Shem from the letters of this verse, however, appears to have thus far proven elusive and, for the last 2,000 years, Hebrew ritual magic has seemingly been unsuccessful at summoning Jehovah. While the 216-letter Shem Ham Farash, Baal Shem, was considered holy, the 72 demonic influences of the Goetia were not, but were seen from very early on in this manuscript's now known history as blasphemous and a sacrilege against the dictates of almost all the dominant religions since the era of Sumer. Therefore, to reconcile the temptation toward practice of the dark arts such grimoires posed during the Reformation era, the stance in Western faith on Solomon was altered, and he gradually came to be seen as having been led astray to worship foreign devils. However, this was not the tale told prior to this era. Until the age of the Ottoman Turks, the Levant region monotheists preserved the tradition of King Solomon as a great magus and as loyal, lifelong, to the one true God. Traditions regarding King Solomon were long preserved even in Axum, Ethiopia, near Lake Tana, Kirkus, at the headwater of the Nile River in Africa, by a group of pre-Christian African Hebrews called the Sakura. It was legend among this people that they descended from the heirs of King Menelik, 
a bastard prince, conceived on the Queen of Sheba by King Solomon himself. Manalak had, according to this people, stolen the stones of testimony from inside the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies of the First Temple, while it was still under construction. Modern rites of Freemasonry also tell more about this period, recounting the murder of the Grand Architect Hiram Abiff by three Master Masons, Jubela, Jubalum, and Jubello. Next, to continue understanding the Cliffoth by comprehending its constituent components, we must skip ahead historically to the 20th century and return to the ritual magician Aleister Crowley. In his work Liber Arcanorum, numbered 231 in his series, Crowley depicted a set of 44 cells in two graphs showing, in one, stylized representations of the imagery of the 22 tarot trumps, each associated with the Hebrew letter, and, in the other, a set of 22 images under the heading of Cliffoth, each with its own Hebrew letter as well. And between these twin charts, he gave an alphabetic cipher to compare one letter from one chart with a different letter from the other. In the diagrams that will soon follow, these 22 pseudo-sigils are used to signify 22 paths on the St. Simon arrangement, or the array of adverse attribute traits on the reverse side of the usual Jacob's Ladder lattice shape. In these arrangements, they will be placed onto these paths according to the manner prescribed by Crowley, assigning each path a Hebrew letter, then comparing one letter on the obverse side to another letter on the reverse side, then placing the corresponding pseudo-sigil there. Thus, these sigils, such as they are, for the Cliffoth, provided by Crowley, will be seen to correspond to other names occupying the same places on the St. Simon array. The final contribution of Aleister Crowley's we will be dealing with directly here comes from his work Liber Fel Ararita, numbered alternately 570 or 813 in his collected works. In Ararita, chapter 2nd Raish, Crowley spells out descriptions of the ten demon kings who reign in hell quite eloquently. Here we can see the names of these ten demon kings placed onto the ten emanations of a usual modern tree of life diagram on the left side of the page and the poem by Crowley from Ararita, Second Resh, on the right side of the page. To understand this component of the Cliffoth, we must now analyze both Crowley's model for a tree of death and his description for the ten demon kings who occupy the cortexes, or shells, on the opposite side from the emanations of the Sephirot on the Tree of Life diagram. Here we can see the ten demon kings can also be corresponded to the seven hells of the Arabs, both as given from Crowley's Liber 777. Thus, the three supernal cliffoth, or shells, are lumped together into the chief hell of Sheol, meaning simply, a grave. The centralmost five reverse sephirot are each double labeled with a demonic king and a hell realm 
it rules over the final lowest two anti-emanations occupied by demon queens are likewise lumped into the lowest form of hell called Gehenna, referring to the ever smoldering waste pit dumped outside the wall of ancient Jerusalem. We will return to placing these attribute traits onto models based on the tree of life of Hakabalah in a moment. However, again, they will be inside the St. Simon array based on the Jacob's Ladder model's design. It should also be noted now that the ten demon kings may also be corresponded to any other base ten group of attributes, including ten orders of demons, the seven hells in ten places of the Arabs, as well as the Ten Commandments. All of these traits will be featured on the St. Simon Array in its simplest form. From Liberara Rita, we learn that the chief demon king, called Satan and Moloch, is twin-headed and ever arguing against itself. Beelzebub, sometimes called Lord of the Flies, Crowley described as like black apes chattering vile nonsense. The Prince of Hell, Lucifuge Rofocal, Crowley compared to devouring mothers that eat up their children, etc., such that Astaroth is like a harpy, Asmodeus rules the burning ones, giant-like volcanoes. Belphegor is petty, selfish, and quarrelsome, like men. Adramalac corresponds to the ravens of death. Baal rules the lying spirits like frogs. Lilith is the queen of the obscene who appear like minotaurs. And finally, Nehema is queen of the underworld, who appears from the head to the navel a woman, but from the navel to the feet a man. Last of the components of the Cliffhoth, one must understand before combining them all into the model of the St. Simon Array, is the postmodern grimoire called the Necronomicon, meaning Book of Dead Names, and inspired by claims of such having once been owned by John Dee. These claims about the 16th century Elizabethan scholar having been made by early 20th century Gothic fiction author H.P. Lovecraft. The Simon Necronomicon was an attempt by a small group of mid-20th century scholars of ritual magic and grimoires to produce, in our present era, a new system of rituals meant to sound prehistoric in their terms and texts. Thus, the Fifty Names of Marduk, given in the Enuma Elish, or Babylonian creation epic, were chosen as the dead names, and each was given a sigil. In summoning these elder gods, we are given their names, a word for their calling, and a brief description of their attribute traits, including their particular skills, etc., Little physical description is usually given. In ritual magic, using the tools given in the usual grimoire genre book, one is encouraged to surround themselves with a magic circle of self-protection and outside of this establish a magic triangle for summoning into it the influence or intelligence one wishes to visualize, project, realize and make manifest. 
in using the Simon Necronomicon material in this or a similar manner, one would repeat one from among the fifty listed dead names as a mantra in one's mind while intoning the call word aloud, likewise over and over, all while meditating on the sigil correspondent to that dead name and its call word. However contrived, the modern Simon Necronomicon provides a complete and self-contained system of ritual magic presented in the usual grimoire genre format, and, so long as the present shift among practitioners of ritual magic continues being toward seeking results, then this grimoire will be seen as no more nonsensical than Anton Zandor LaVey's use, also from the postmodern era, of the name Satan, inserted into an invocation for one of John Dee's Enochian heirs, and certainly is more scholarly. The Simon Necronomicon's value as a grimoire has not been tried and tested for as long as many others. However, it should be seen as no less authentically a grimoire in the same tradition as these other works and as potentially useful in gaining ritual magical result. Nevertheless, again, it should be ardently cautioned against attempting any such feats without group guidance, proper preparation, and or at least some significant intent. It is cautioned in most grimoires that summoning the intelligences and influences they allow you to call up, if you lack sincere and serious motive in doing so, can provoke them to mistrust and abuse you both during and, if you're not careful, after the ritual as well. When tinkering with such ritual magic, one does well to remember that no results may be highly preferable to bad results, depending on which phantom one wishes to entertain. It is wise, if one does go fooling about with ritual magic, for one to know and practice often as many ritual banishing techniques as one can learn. After all, ritual magic is founded on superstitious, obsessive-compulsive disorder. Banishing evil and psychic self-defense must become like a second nature to someone actively practicing this craft, if only to protect themselves against their own imaginary ghosts. The sigils attached to the Simon Necronomicon's list of 50 dead names of Marduk were invented in the 20th century, but their recency should not be predicted to dull their efficacy in meditative trance states and ritual magical workings. Here we see a square of 7 by 7 equals 49 circled sigils with the fiftieth and last subtended at the bottom. These are the Simon Necronomicon's fifty sigils equivalent to the fifty dead names and calls. Each one is numbered to correspond to the name and call given in the preceding list. Unlike other sigils dating from this era, the Simon Necronomicon sigils do not appear to be unicursal tracings from one location to another on a lettered layman that is then removed. On the contrary to being literal or epistemological in any way, the Simon Necronomicon sigils appear to be abstractions, the creation of free association on the part of their authors. The sigils of the fifty dead names of the Simon Necronomicon may be thought of best as being merely a placeholder symbolizing these fifty names of Marduk in a shorthand notation. Similarly, 
the 22 Cliffoth pseudo sigils of Aleister Crowley may be seen as shorthand notation for the 22 paths on a reversed tree of life diagram. Likewise, as we are about to begin exploring, these 50 dead names and 22 Cliffoth paths may be combined onto the single model of the St. Simon array of a Jacob's Ladder manifold lattice. As such, a St. Simon style model may be constructed by using both the 50 Necronomicon sigils and 22 Cliffoth pseudo sigils, as well as by using only the 72 Goetic sigils. If one combines both of these models together, one will have reached the maximum capacity of 144 attribute traits on the Jacob's Ladder Manifold Lattice. From my own book, The Tree of Death and the Cliffoth, we see here the St. Simon arrangement of wholly adverse attribute traits to the combined Tree of Life and Tree of Death diagram called, in turn, the Jacob's Ladder Manifold Lattice. Now, though the Saint Simon is described in my book, it is there depicted only in its Hebrew form, as seen here. However, in my book it was necessary to give an equal amount of study to both the attribute traits on the Saint Simon array and the other version presented in the book of a similar arrangement, all in English, called the Blind Dragon Array. While the Saint Simon gives the names of ten demon kings, ten orders of demons, twelve curses, seven hells in ten places, and the letters attributed to the twenty-two paths of the Cliffoth, all in Hebrew, the Blind Dragon gives ten orders of demons, ten commandments, seven hells in ten places, seven venal sins, twelve curses, and twenty-two illnesses, all in English. In addition to these traits, both the Saint Simon and Blind Dragon arrangements are crowned above by a triangle of six traits and adorned below by a pentagram of ten. In this initial model of the St. Simon array, both the terms labeling the upper triangle and the letters labeling the lower pentagram are Hebrew. The terms inside the upper triangle describe the conditions of existence prior to the creation of our present reality as chaos and void, or rather, in Hebrew, as tohu and bohu, respectively. Just so, chasek, or darkness, was on the face of the deep, the letters surrounding the lower pentagram spell three names counterclockwise around it. These names are spelled, starting from outside the lowest tip of the pentagram, Shin, Aleph, Dao, Aleph, Nun, pronounced Satan. Starting from the rightmost corner, Beth, Pe. Ayin, Mem, Dao, pronounced Baphomet, and starting from inside the lowest tip of the pentagram, Yod, He, Shin, Vav, He, pronounced Yeshua, being the tetragrammaton, four-letter name of God with the mother letter Shin inserted in the center. We will return to the St. Simon arrangement to translate its Hebrew attribute traits into English in a moment, but before we do so we must momentarily devote some time 
to the blind dragon arrangement as well. Here we will begin to see the translations of some of the St. Simon's Hebrew traits, but also the addition of others not included later on. On the blind dragon arrangement, we may find all the traits are color-coded. The Ten Commandments, Seven Venal Sins, Six Traits of the Upper Triangle, and Five of the Lower Pentagram are all in black. The Ten Orders of Demons and Twenty-Two Illnesses associated respectively with the cortexes and paths on the reverse tree of life part of the diagram are all color-coded blue. The seven hells in ten places and twelve curses associated respectively with the cortexes and paths of the tree of death part of the diagram are color-coded red along with the uppermost triangle and lowermost pentagram shapes as well. These color codings make it easier to discern between the Tree of Life and the Tree of Death portions of the combined Jacob's Ladder Manifold Lattice. However, in our subsequent studies here for now, we will not be returning to them again. They remain a unique aspect of this particular depiction of the Blind Dragon Array. However, it may be useful to remember these color codings in examining the upcoming diagrams, simply in order to keep straight what attribute trait goes in place where. On this Blind Dragon model, we may quite clearly see the 22 paths and 10 emanations of the Tree of Life in blue and the twelve paths and seven shells of the Tree of Death in red. However, in later models, showing essentially the same attribute traits, we may not be able to discern which rank and file is associated to which of these twin conjoined systems so easily then. What we must remember at this point is that the Blind Dragon and St. Simon arrays are both based on the Jacob's Ladder Manifold Lattice, and therefore are simply some amounts of attribute traits, whether in Hebrew or in English, that may be distilled from this diagrammatic setting and simply set out in lists as such. What we should remember at this point also is that these attribute traits being diagrammed or listed are meant to be adverse and opposite to the most holy traits of Kabbalah. They are lists of the worst types of things, such as places in hell and types of curses and types of beings, the demon kings and orders of demons, in existence and, as such, are liable to cause anxiety and discomfort even when only consumed subliminally as in passing by. To study these in continuity requires constitutional rectitude. Now, let us continue. Here we see the ten demon kings in the lower right as they appear on the ten cortexes on the reverse sides of the ten emanations on the tree of life. Satan and Moloch are reverse Kether, Beelzebub is reverse Chakma, Belphegor reverse Binah, Lucifer reverse Tifereth, and so forth down to Lilith over opposite Yesod, and Nehema over opposite Malkuth. Above this, in the upper right corner, we see these traits listed on the by now familiar Tetractus layout where Satan and Moloch are now the one king, Nehema and Lilith, the two queens, etc. Beside these attribute traits to the left, we find the, also hopefully by now familiar, 
22 traits attributed to the paths on the reverse of the Tree of Life. These are given as names of the Clifoth pseudo-sigils and various types of historically common illnesses. Finally, the far left lists 40 attribute traits in Hebrew name and English translation as four lists assigned to the four terrestrial elements comprised of ten traits each. In the upper leftmost is water. In the lower leftmost is air. In the upper rightmost is fire. And in the lower rightmost the element earth. Forty plus twenty-two plus ten equals 72 traits, once again, being expressed in this model. Now, let us return to the St. Simon arrangement and examine its traits again, only this time in English. Here we find the English transliterations of all the terms labeled and related by the first St. Simon, Manifold Lattice presented there in Hebrew. So we see Tohu and Bohu ruling over all, Malak Satan ruling Thaumiel, Beelzebub ruling Chagiel, Belphegor over Satariel, Lucifer over Tagagarim, etc. All these terms appear on the preceding arrangement of lists, and all may be cross-referenced in this way to be translated from these transliterations into their correspondent English terms. For example, Kemetiel means literally a crowd of gods, or as I put it here, a pantheon. Likewise, we may see that just as Moloch Satan, the demon king, rules the order of demons called Thaumael, meaning twins, so too does the demon queen Lilith rule the order of demons called Samael, meaning the blind. In the lowest cortex on this manifold lattice arrangement, we find Nehema, the demon queen ruling the order of demons called the Lilin, harpy-like night hags who stole away unwatched babies. Around the lower pentagram in this depiction of the St. Simon array, we find the five kingdoms of Edom and the five types of Canaanite who dwelt there prior to the invasion of the Holy Lands by the Hebrew diaspora at the end of their Exodus era. Again, however, all we are seeing with the Saint Simon and Blind Dragon arrangements of adverse attribute traits onto the Jacob's Ladder format diagram are exactly 72 traits that, in addition to being charted on the Jacob's Ladder manifold lattice, may be listed simply and outright in five sets of ten apiece and one set of twenty-two. While categorizing these evil names in this by now extremely mundane manner may seem to be empowering of the practitioner over this work, take heed and beware that when staring long into the abyss, the abyss stares long back into you, so you should not by fighting a monster, become a monster yourself. Bear in mind, also, these traits are the most concentrated form of pure evil known to the minds of humans. So concentrate, focus, and be aware. Here we see, again, the listed format of the transliterated traits on the St. Simon Array. Satan and Moloch are the one king, Nehemiah and Lilith the two queens, etc., as in past listings. 
while the twenty-two trumps are those demons who rule over various illnesses. Each of the remaining forty traits may be assigned to an intersection of a row of numerals with a column of terrestrial element, and thus be assigned to a pipped card, one through ten, in one of four suits in a deck. These forty traits include the five kingdoms of Edom from the lower pentagram, and the six traits, including Tohu, Bohu, Chasek, and Kemetiel, of the upper triangle. However, the location of these traits on the Jacob's Ladder Manifold lattice and the order in which they appear in this listed format, instead, may be drastically unlike one another. Thus, the five kingdoms of Edom and six traits of the upper triangle are spread about throughout the lesser forty, such that the order of their assignations appears arbitrary and scrambled, and such that, thus, each trait may be shuffled up into any other order equally as well. Although each placement is carefully weighed and balanced, thought through and analyzed, experimented with and removed, only to be tested again, their overall assignations seem randomized and without pattern to underscore the facts that all these attribute traits may be rearranged and that there is, ultimately, no universally agreeable, single, right, and correct order for them all. As the sums of variables attributed to this model increase, the manner of categorizing and cataloging them all must, necessarily, become more complex to keep pace. This brings us back to the method for categorizing 144 attribute traits onto the Jacob's Ladder Manifold lattice, and the listing of each location by a simple number sum. The arrangement of attribute traits we see here is the same as the listing for the St. Simon's transliterations we saw last. However, here, the locations of each trait are marked by numerals instead of names. The reason we return now to this method of encryption is to plot the locations of the sigils of the Goetia, the Necronomicon, and Crowley's Cliffoth Sui Generis on the Jacob's Ladder diagram. These diagrams, which I will show you in a moment, are parallel systems to the St. Simon and Blind Dragon arrays, while the traits assigned onto the St. Simon are Hebrew names transliterated into English, and those of the Blind Dragon the translations of many of these terms into their counterpart terms in English. The Jacob's Ladder diagrams depicting the Goetic and Necronomicon sigils and Cliffoth pseudo-sigils are each an authentically separate set of 72 symbols, and thus, only by relative counting number sums, can they both be shown on one list or on a single Jacob's Ladder diagram. Again, however, the importance of disguising the models I am about to show you behind this veil of cryptography using number sums to substitute for the shorthand sigils themselves, is not solely for convenience in categorizing the large amount of variable attribute traits alone. The purpose in concealing the diagrams in this banal methodology of ordering by rank and file each attribute trait with a coordinate pair of number sums also serves to shelter the student from the sort of fear that can, rightly, accompany being suddenly exposed to something from so deep in the dark arts of ritual magic. If, for example, one wished to lay out across a desk some of the schematics I am about to show, it would trigger, at the least, unwanted curiosity from any passerby and likely prove to be much more trouble than it would be worth to even try. 
So one reason numbers are here substituted for sigils in this listing and key to the following diagrams is that numbers are a far more familiar shape than the sigils and will cause less of a stir if seen. So we see again that the 72 traits of the Goetic Shemham for Ash are labeled by a number sum followed by a parenthesis while the 50 dead names of Marduk from the Simon Necronomicon are labeled by a number sum followed by a period. Thus, the first sigil from the Necronomicon appears in the cortex of reverse Kether, while the first sigil from the Goetia appears on the path leading vertically into this cortex from below, etc. As we shall see, fitting these sigils onto this manifold lattice is a matter of some scale of difficulty, simply given the constraints of its geometric proportions, etc. Thus, again, to list all 144 attribute traits onto a single Jacob's Ladder model, it is convenient to use numeral sums for shorthand. As we may see here, the placement of the 50th sigil from the Necronomicon and that of the 50th sigil from the Goetia both correspond to the same location on the model, that being reverse Malkuth, while the 47th sigil from the Necronomicon corresponds to the 72nd and final sigil from the Goetia at the lowest tip of the lower pentagram. So these attribute traits have their correspondences from the St. Simon array as well. Here then is a Jacob's Ladder manifold lattice with a subtended pentagram and topped by a triangle. Onto it have been drawn the 50 sigils of the Necronomicon and the 22 pseudo-sigils of Crowley's Cliffhoth such that each space on the manifold lattice has at least one attribute trait assigned to it, while 13 places on the manifold, being the 10 cortexes opposite the 10 emanations on the Tree of Life, and the 6 traits assigned to the upper triangular halo, express double traits. By this point, I should hope it would be crystal clear that Although these attribute trait sigils may look haphazard, random, and chaotic at first glance, their exact placement on the manifold lattice is actually the product of an enormous amount of calculation of correspondences to reach a determination of what goes where. Nevertheless, these attribute traits placement is ultimately arbitrary and, again, no absolutely right order might truly even exist. On this model, it may be seen that Crowley's 22 Cliffoth pseudo-sigils are placed, accordingly, onto the 22 paths of the Tree of Life component of the Jacob's Ladder geometry. All the rest of the sigils are from the Simon Necronomicon, including where the sigils double up on the ten cortexes and the supernal triangle. As described, the purpose of placing these sigils as attribute traits onto a Jacob's Ladder arrangement diagram is as a shorthand notation for referencing the 50 dead names and 22 Cliffoth sui generis the geometric relationships these 72 traits form on the Jacob's Ladder lattice, though indicative, remain incidental because the traits may all still be shuffled up like playing cards in a deck. The placement of one such sigil relative to another such sigil on the lattice is merely a mnemonic meant to assist the memory. Think of each sigil as like a key code that fits into and unlocks a gateway or portal to a linear path or tunnel and thus through this sickle pattern 
while it is being meditated upon and thus the circuit gate is open may be evoked some sensibility certainly from beyond the mundane mind to say that these sigils can induce inspiration and spark the imagination would be merely a conceited understatement however to go so far as to label them actually discorporeal entities existing autonomously as minds in the ether poses certain ethical questions about the civil rights of ghosts the arrangement shown here lists the 50 sigils of the Simon Necronomicon on the left and the 22 pseudo sigils of Crowley's Cliffoth Sui Generis on the right here we see again that Marduk is the one king over the Tetractus of ten royal attribute traits and that as before the four elemental suits are labeled from left to right water air fire earth each of these 50 sigils has its own place on the Jacob's ladder array alongside the 22 sigils of Crowley's Cliffoth and so each has their order in the lists shown here Lastly, here, then, is a Jacob's Ladder manifold lattice with a subtended pentagram and topped by a triangle. Onto it have been drawn the 72 sigils of the Goetic Shamhamphorash, such that each space on the manifold lattice has at least one attribute trait assigned to it. The same ten cortexes and the supernal triangle have doubled traits depicted here as in the previous diagram showing the 50 dead names and 22 cliffoth so we may see this manifold lattice as a framework upon which are drawn the 72 sigils of the goetia we may further see if we so choose to that these goetic sigils may each act like a key code such as a passphrase and secret grip establishing contact between an onlooker and in this case a very much older system for ritual magic the goetic intelligences or demonic influences that may be accessed and activated by the study and practice of this system of ritual magic are all here nakedly displayed on this manifold lattice like a four-dimensional phone book you simply draw out one of the sigils from this shape and summon it forth as a servitor but here is posed a dilemma of conscience being faced with such a device how would you use it Pandora's box contains Schrodinger's cat and should we choose to open it we may not like what we find likewise wishing to attain clearer more focused and more accurate thinking may be a noble enough cause however seeking to use goetic ritual magic as simply personal brain stimulation may not yield the desired effect it is wise to heed the warning calls of the elder generations whose errors we should learn from to not repeat it may have been the error of the makers of the goetic system to believe in it being possessed of supernatural powers however this should not discount the genius of the mind behind the mind that invented this particular grimoire whatever force inspired the designer of such sigil based systems as the goetia Grimoires like it remain a magnificent testimony to superstitious ritual magic. Thus, whether the fifty dead names of the Simon Necronomicon and the twenty-two Cliffoth Sui Generis, both hailing from the twentieth century, or the seventy-two demonic influences of the Goetic Shimhamphorash, dating back ostensibly to no later than the 1500s AD, 
sigil-based grimoires of superstitious ritual magic impute importance onto, essentially, gobbledygook sigils, usually originally free-form or automatic art. In order to deter unwanted inquiries from onlookers and to protect themselves from all unwanted inquisition, this layer of encryption is usually enough to ward off most evil eyes. However, it is usually also best to hold this layer back, to hedge your bets, and to present any onlookers with the numerically encrypted double blind model first. So, given that the Saint Simon, in Hebrew and English, the blind dragon, color-coded in English, the Simon Necronomicon and Crowley's Cliffoth in one model, and the 72 Goetic Shemhamfarash in another, all complement the original Jacob's Ladder design and can each, also, produce an arrangement of their attribute traits as a list of them all, etc. Then it stands to reason that if one is stacking up such base 72 systems, one will eventually get to 144 to 216, and even to 360 attribute traits. Once one has filled one's head with this many averse attributes and evil traits, it may be safest to resort to a banishing ritual after it all, simply to ward off one's own gullibility and being prone to any residual superstitious obsessive compulsion 